While they're dismissing, please find in your Bibles the Revelation. The Revelation, and that is toward the end in your copy of the Scripture. And kids, be careful about being disturbing going out there. Being a disturbance. Teenagers, uh, wanted to again show you, I have a brand new uh, King James Version. Uh, it's uh, printed by Hendrickson uh, Christian Classics or Hendrickson Bibles. But this has uh, this is a decent quality, entry quality uh, copy of the Scripture. And it actually is a sewn binding. And it has genuine imitation leather. So, genuine imitation leather. This is going to be a prize uh, for, for one of our young people. I want to just let you know that. If you'd like to come check it out, handle it, and open it up and look at it and so forth. It has nice readable print, red letter edition. And that's going to be a gift to somebody uh, that they're going to have to earn somehow. <laughs> gift that's earned. Okay, I hope you guys caught all that. Genuine imitation and a gift that's earned. Are you in Revelation? Okay, let's go down to verse 4. And let's just go ahead, and I think it would be appropriate this morning, if everybody's physically able to, let's, let's go ahead and stand as we read the Scripture this morning. I know it's a little unusual. We found your place and gotten comfortable. But I'd like to read verses 4 all the way down to verse uh, 8. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Let's open with prayer. Father, this morning, as we get into the Scripture, before we do that, we really need to in our hearts to bow before You. You are the King of kings, which is and which was and is to come. God, more than that, You are you are Creator God. And it is with great awe that we're reminded that You are also the One who sent Your Son who loved us and washed us from our sins in Your own blood. What a wonderful Savior You are. I pray that this morning as we begin to seek the blessing that comes from, from reading and from hearing and keeping the things that are written in this book of the prophecy, that Lord, even now you begin to prepare us, prepare our minds and our hearts. And I pray that we learn today from the Scripture things that would impact us. Not only this week, but impact us in the way we live for the rest of our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing this morning. Please be seated. We are in chapter 1 of Revelation. And really is a... Uh, it really is a tragedy, isn't it? That oftentimes the perception that many individuals have toward the Revelation is that it's a mysterious book. You know what the word Revelation means, don't you? It means to reveal. right? So it's very opposite of it. It's, it's incredible to me uh, when you begin to discuss this portion of the book of the prophecy. It's incredible oftentimes just the commentary that you hear. In other words, people would say, I love Revelation. Man, I just... Man, some of those scenes in Revelation, they're just really, you know, and they'll describe a scene in Revelation, something really rather apocalyptic, and they'll say, man, it's just such a mystery, I just don't know what it means. You know, or what do you think it means? And the reality of it is that in the Revelation, almost everything means exactly what it says. I've had people say, well, Pastor, you think that the horses are tanks? Do you think the locusts are helicopters? No. The horses are horses, and the locusts are locusts. And you say, well, they're not like any locusts we've ever seen. No, they're not like any locusts we've ever seen. That's why the description of the locusts 
in Revelation. In other words, the scenes that you see unfolding in Revelation, they are, they are just surreal, aren't they? I mean, they're just, they are just very, very difficult to imagine even with the words in which they're described. I have difficulty, don't you, imagining what John describes in chapter 4 of Revelation when he describes the scene in heaven where holy God is on his throne. I mean, I, I just I have no idea what God looks like. I have no idea. Uh, I've never seen where holiness creates smoke and where voices make thunder and where the pillars of a room you know, shake. Now, I've been in tremors before, you know, where a building shaking. But, I, you know, I just, I can imagine lightning and thunder. How many of y'all have been enjoying the weather lately? I have really enjoyed the weather lately. It's just been really fantastic. Andrew says he woke up last night. You didn't like the weather? No. Our Saturday night was majestic. Somewhere down our street, like halfway down our block, lightning struck. And it was the first bolt of lightning. It wasn't like where lightning moves in. It's like it's just silent, and all of a sudden, you see, and I was sitting in our living room, and I just see the outside just light up, just, and then instantly with it is the, I can't make the booming sound, but the boom, you know, the crash of the thunder, like instantly, I thought, that's, yes, ma'am. We were blessed to be sitting on the beach, and the oh. whole time we were sitting there last night until about midnight, and when it got dark, it was constant. Oh, what a landscape. Yeah. It was. We couldn't hear the thunder uh -huh. because of the waves, but we could see the lightning all yeah. across the sky. It was That's one of my favorite summer evening activities, if I have time, is just to go down to the beach and watch the heat lightning breaking. And, and so then I watched it and actually counted between. It's funny because usually thunder comes your way, a storm comes your direction. This one started at my house and moved away. And you, we, I was counting, you know how you count between the thunder and you figure how far away it is. And I, I was seeing bright flashes of light and counting 45 seconds. And that's probably like almost a Davy as the, as the storm was moving away. And really, it literally occupied, I don't know, about an hour of my time. Let's see, I guess that was Friday night. Uh, not Saturday night, but Friday evening. And I kept yelling into Melissa, there's another one! And then we'd count, you know, and then 30, 35 seconds, 40 seconds, 45 seconds later, you'd hear it. And it's just, it's just majestic. It's incredible to me. I've never heard a voice like thunder. I mean, I have been awestruck. I've been thunderstruck, if you will, by lightning crashing. You ever been outside? And I mean, just boom, right there. Twice in my life, it's been very, very close. When I was in elementary school in Kansas, my mom used to, my mom's like one of those people that can do anything, and can make anything, can build anything. And she made in our backyard, she made our black backyard a playground. She wanted all the kids, she wanted to be able to have her kids at home playing. And so she didn't want to just, you know, if we're going to play with the other kids in the neighborhood, she wanted them all to come play at our house. And so we had a huge, she took these big power poles and made a swing set out of them and had a big tire swing thing on it. And, and she, it was really, really, really big. And we had an actual jungle gym. And uh, we had, she made these playhouses out of, we had these big A tires. And you probably guys, if you're not from agricultural country, you don't know what big A tires are. But the tire, if it's sitting on its side, it's about that tall. And then they're just really big around. And she put one up on a platform and we put, made a roof into it and cut holes in it. We played in these tires. They had like three or four of them, one half buried in the ground. It's like a little fortress. You know, you could play king of the castle, push people off of them and all kinds of things. They're, they're really neat. And so we had those in our backyard. I remember it was outside, and my mom let us stay out when it was raining one time. And we were in the big A tire, and we had this little lid that we put on the top of it. And we're sitting high and dry, you know, in our little fort out there. And then in our backyard, I remember my mom, she was looking out the back window in the backyard, and lightning crashed in our yard and just smoked a section of the grass. Just boom! And you want to talk about upwardly mobile individuals. <laughs> we shot out of that thing, hit the ground, and ran into the house, you know. And I mean, just like that. Another time, uh, it was back in 2000, we were taking teenagers to the Bill Rice Ranch. We were coming back from camp. We had a U-Haul trailer that we had our luggage in. It was behind the church van. We'd left on Friday night, and we're driving till we got somewhere north of Orlando. And when we got to that area, just a little bit north of Orlando, we stopped, and we were actually... For some reason, we were changing. 
uh, in, in using the U-Haul trailer as a dressing room. And I remember I was standing guard. I closed the door down. There was a flashlight in there, and each person would go in and change. And I think it was Melissa. She wasn't my wife back then. Uh, she, she was inside, and I had closed the door. I'm standing guard, make sure nobody comes and opens the door of the trailer while someone's changing in it. And boom, like from me to the fence outside. Uh, lightning hit, and you know, like you're guarding the door. It, it's one of those things where you know, I, I invented a new form of dancing. It was called the high step, and uh, you know, it's like I don't know where to go, but it's just, just kind of, you know, you that electricity gets absorbed by you, and uh, the, you know, lightning just crashed right by me. It's really an amazing thing. The voices in heaven crying, "Holy, holy, holy!" have that effect in the throne room of, of heaven. And that's continually going on in that place. And so the scene of where God is is something that really is... I can imagine a little bit, but I can't really come into uh, the full comprehension. I can just know the things that I can relate to about it. John... Uh, are, okay, so now having said all of that, many of the scenes that we see unfolding as we get further on in the Revelation will be scenes that things are described in that we don't know what they are, but they're described and they are what they are described to be. Having said that, let me just say this. If the Scripture wants us to compare something, then God being the grammarian that He is, gave His Word with comparison words, words of comparison. The word like is a word of comparison, right? The word as or such as, are words of comparison. In the original language would be the word homoias, like or as or such as, would be words of comparison. And in the scripture, when something says, this is what it was, then that's what it was. It's not an allegory. It's not doesn't have a hidden meaning that is open for interpretation. Everyone, it's what it is. But when it says it was like this, then it, that's what it's like. Now, sometimes you'll see words of comparison, like in chapter 1, where John sees one like unto the Son of Man. So it looks like Jesus. And I believe, in that context, uh, I believe that it could be none other than Jesus that John sees, but there appeared to him... I'm sorry, this is... I don't know why it's doing that. I wish it were not, but we'll have to live with it for today. Uh, the word that John uses there is a like word. Now, having said that, I want to just look at briefly what we were introduced to last week. First of all, I want to remind you why we study Revelation. Why we preach the Revelation. Well, not just because it's interesting, but because according to chapter 3, there's a blessing in it. The Holy Spirit says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And I remind you that the Scripture here is not merely for our entertainment. It's not simply to tickle our fancy. It is so that we can read, so we can hear, so we can understand, and then practically speaking, so we can keep the things that are written in it. Revelation is a portion of the Scripture that is intended to be kept. And I cannot overemphasize that. I cannot emphasize it enough. Because most of the time that prophecy is studied is to look at what somebody's going to do someday versus what I'm going to do today. Do you see the way, the manner, the attitude that we're to study the Revelation? We're supposed to study it saying, what can I do today? And as we read it, I encourage last week when we introduced ourselves to this book, I encourage you to read it. And as you read it, ask the question, what does this mean for me today? It is not a book which is given so that we can have a glimpse into the future and stand by and wait for the future to come so then we can live it. It's a book that's written so we can see the future so that we can know how presently to live today. And there's nothing more plainly indicated than the way it's written in the Scripture. You are supposed to keep the things that are written in the book. And by that, the word keep is not simply a word of retention. It's not like secrete this away in a, in a stash or a cachet and hold on to it. The idea is do. Do what you learn. 
put it into practice. And so there are some interesting things that uh, we see here today. I uh, want to kind of finish off or cap off last week's uh, message, but I want to just give us our secondary reminder, or, or, or just encapsulate our secondary reminder, and that is that our, this series is not going to have an impact in our lives unless it's coupled with careful reading, hearing, and keeping. And I asked you last week, would you make this study for the rest of this fall that we're going to be in, would you make this personal? Would you please internalize this? We're not just uh, filling time on Sunday morning. You're filling time by coming here, and I'm filling time by preaching something. We want this to impact us. So will you please study Revelation? You could literally, if you're and an, an, uh, probably a little maybe above average reader, you can literally read through Revelation in under 30 minutes of your time. Uh, if you're a below average reader, then whatever amount of time it is, is not so significant that you could not invest some of your life into it. Matter of fact, if you're a horrible reader, couldn't you try to just make it through maybe a half a chapter a day? And inside of uh, a little over a month, you'll have made it through Revelation. It, let's make this personal. Let's internalize it. Uh, let me just encourage you about something. Perhaps I mentioned this last week, or perhaps I did not. Write down questions. If you have something and you say, I don't know what this is. I don't know what the Scripture is saying, or I don't know what's being referred to here. Write down the question. Uh, three by five cards are your friend and mine. But they're a little bit dated, so can I say to you that emails and texts are your friend? Write it down in a text and text it to me. If you have a question, and it's quite possible that it'll either be something that I'll answer to you or something that we'll make sure that's covered as we preach through the Revelation. So let's make this a practical, practical series. And again, everything that's written in it is not simply written for information's sake. It's written to transform us. It's written to be transformative. Does that excite you as much as it does me? I mean, isn't it exciting to know that there is something here that says... Read this, hear it, keep it, and there's a blessing for you. This is not, you know, a promise to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob here, folks. This is written in the church age to the church. And this is not a blessing principle here that we're looking at. This is a blessing promise. You ever look at blessings in the Bible? I'm encouraged a lot of times by studying blessings, but I'm oftentimes reminded that's not specifically for me. There's an underlying principle there, perhaps, that could apply to me, but it's not my blessing. This one is mine. It's for me. And that excites me, thrills me. There are a couple places in the New Testament that every time I read them, I'm just like, me, that's, that's for me. And not in a vain, glorious, selfish way, but I mean, it's, it's God's interested in me, and God's got something where my name is written there and it's intended for me. Let me give you a couple for instances. Uh, in John, I believe it's chapter 17, when Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, and He prays for His disciples, and He says, Father, I've keep them. I've kept them while I'm in the world, and now they're Thine, and, I'm, and, and, and uh, they're Yours, and You keep them. And of course, coupled that with the prayer is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then in that prayer, Jesus said, I pray also for them that will believe. In other words, not just the people that I've kept and that have believed under my ministry, but for the people who are going to come to believe. Who's that talking about on a personal level? I'm like, Jesus is praying for me here. Jesus mentioned me by name right here. It's just really internalized, really personal. When I go to 1 John chapter 5 and I look at uh, you know, the promise that the person who believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God and He has the witness in Himself. And then, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe. And I just, I've, I've got Bibles where Ryan's written there. That's my name, by the way. My parents did not name me Pastor. My parents named me Ryan. And uh, where Ryan is written there. I've written my name there. I just, psh, sometimes I call myself Pastor anymore. <laughs> hey, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Here, because people don't know who I am. But, <laughs> Ryan, it's written to me. It's personal. 
And isn't it wonderful that we have that kind of a God who's personal? And this, this entire letter is revealed so that we personally can benefit by it and have God's blessing. Want God's blessing? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> right? Do you want God's blessing? I mean, that's how, that is how real it is. There really is a blessing here for you. If you'll meet the qualification of chapter 1 and verse 3. That's worthwhile, isn't it? It's worth our time. Okay? So now, uh, let's get for some information here. Uh, I do want to say, as we study Revelation, that it's going to be important for us, especially in the day and age in which we live, it's going to be important for us to realize some things about God. And I'm going to, I'm going to speak in some sarcastic undertone here for just a minute, but I'm not intending necessarily just sarcasm. But I want, to, I want you to understand something, and that would specifically be this. To assume that God is not the master of grammar when He's the creator of the universe and everything in it is ridiculous, isn't it? It's interesting. Some of the things that settle us about end times and even the order of events in end times are so settled by the chronological grammatical aspects of Revelation. And then people are saying, well, that's just grammar. There's a reason why people who hate God consider the Bible to be good literature. There's a reason why there's never been a book which has been mass-produced and printed on the level of the Bible. No open-minded um, honest scholar exists who does not in some form have a copy of the Scripture. You say, Pastor, that's a rather biased statement. Well, of course it is. I'm biased. I, I recognize my bias in it. But, I'm, but it's really true, isn't it? For instance, Anthony and I knocked on doors two weeks ago, and we got a biased guy to admit his bias. He said, ah, it's religion, man. I'm like, yeah, religion, man. I, if somebody bashes religion, I always try to... I wish I had like a, a ball that said religion I could just kick. You know, but I hate religion too. You know, I really am a religion hater. I don't like religion. And so he started with the, I, you know, religion. I said, yeah, you know, let, let me come in and we'll stand side by side and we'll, we'll bash it. I said, but I hate religion too. Let's both talk about what we hate about religion. And I told him I hate that religion is used. Uh, to control people. I hate that it's used to manipulate. I hate that it's used for self-enrichment. I hate that it's uh, that it is a, a farce that, that blinds people from truth. And you know, you can just go on and on and on about all the things we hate about religion. But uh, I asked the guy. I said, uh, "Have you ever read the Bible?" And he actually admitted it. He said, "Well, actually, he said, I do know a lot about the Bible, but I've never read it." That would be like knowing a lot about the news by watching one of the. Uh, like, CNN. <laughs> like one of them, right? Whichever one you like. You know, there's, I know a lot about what's going on by watching the news. You better check on what happened. You, you ever, anyone ever been to a televised event or something that was reported on the news? You ever been to something and then it was reported? And you go home and you watch, you're like, I wonder what they're going to report. And you're like, scratching your head like, that really is not what happened at all. That isn't what was said at all. And you realize, wow, if you go on, on their reporting, you don't really know what happened. And, uh, you know, that's like knowing what's going on by watching the news or not reading uh, anything more than the headlines because what is reported always is, always has a bias, right? In other words, what is reported is what the author thinks is important or what he wants to, to report. Now, I'm not getting off on, I don't, don't think I'm, I'm not being political and I'm not getting off on the news. I'm just trying to help you with, to understand that a person who knows about the Bible knows what people have said about the Bible, and he knows what someone's bias against the Bible is, but he's not open-minded, is he? In other words, if you reject everything in the Scripture and you've never read it, you're not an open-minded, unbiased individual. Many individuals, and this is all I ask for people when I try to share the Gospel, many individuals have come into Christ by just being open-minded by saying, okay, I don't really believe there's truth, but I'm open to it. And so anyway, what I was going to say about this guy we talked to a couple weeks ago, he agreed to take one of our copies of Genesis 1 through 3, John and Romans, and read it. And he said I could come back and talk to him about it afterward. And I said, you know, you're open-minded. 
no, I've never read the scripture. I know a lot about it, but I've never read it. And I said, well, don't you think you ought to read it? Know for yourself. And he did. So, okay. All right. Now, God's a grammarian. Did I say that? God's the best grammarian, and there is no literature like the scripture as pertains to grammar. Did you know that if you were privileged enough to be educated in American English, did you know that the grammar principles and rules and laws came from a study by Noah Webster of the King James Version of the Bible? In other words, our language, our grammar in our nation was built around usages in the King James Bible. There isn't any bad grammar in the King James Bible. Did you know that? And do you know there's no bad grammar in the Greek? Or the Hebrew or the Aramaic? The original language is written in? Why? Well, because God gave His Word perfectly. And even in giving it perfectly, He gave it with perfect grammar. You say, Pastor, I did not come here for that. I did not know what you're talking about. Well, let me just uh, draw the conclusion. The tenses in Revelation help us to understand order of events. And the tenses are past, present, and future, specifically in chapter 1. And if you'll look at the tenses, you'll know order of events of future events. Uh, the Old Testament of the Scripture is not arranged chronologically. A lot of times we think, well, Genesis, you know, was written first. No, Job was written first, actually. Um, you know, the prophets... Has anybody here ever been confused? Like when you're reading a prophet and you're thinking, well, this guy should have been at this time, and then you actually look at his contemporaries, and the prophets or the minor prophets, and you realize, wait, no, this is an early on prophet. This is a later prophet. The prophets are not arranged chronologically. And the prophecy in the Scripture is not chronological. In other words, from the time that God was working through Israel and even the times before that, when something was prophesied as a future event, it was way off in the future. There are things that are prophesied in the prophets that today are past. In other words, they've been, they've been, they've come to the full conclusion of the prophecy. They've been fulfilled. Daniel chapter 9. Do you ever just ask the question, why did the wise men go to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him? Did they just go, a star? There must be a king of the Jews. Let's go worship him. I'm not saying God's beyond that, but did you know that that isn't how, what they were doing? They were responding to what Daniel was given by the Lord in Daniel chapter 8 and 9. When an angel of the Lord came and said, the 70 years are 70 weeks, and a week is a measure of seven. And they were able to understand that 70 times 7 is 490 and then subtract and go to 62. And this is when the Messiah is going to come. And they were able to add up the years and actually have a calendar date for the day Jesus Christ will be born. And they went to Jerusalem seeking Him. And they said, Where is He that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen His star in the east and are come to worship Him. And the people at Jerusalem said, Well, oh, He's over in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it's written by the prophets. <laughs> That's prophecy fulfilled, you see. Specifically given, believed, and fulfilled. And Jesus Christ fulfilled every single prophecy of a Messiah who would come and be cut off for the sins of a nation. Now, Revelation concerns Jesus Christ and His future coming to fulfill other prophecies about our Messiah, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and in Revelation. Now, you see what I'm trying to help us understand? In other words, the fact that Revelation is written differently than the prophets of Israel wrote and that the emphasis there is chronological is a big deal. Because it helps us to go back and look at different events and to be able to set them in order and understand what the next event on God's calendar is. Tragically today, there is a major debate on what the next event on God's calendar is. 
See, there are individuals that just think that the tribulation is going to happen, the persecution is not going to be what we see today as persecution of the saints, but that believers are going to be part of the tribulation. And they overlook and miss a major, major event. A couple of major events in prophecy. In other words, they're saying, hey, believers are going to be part of these events in Revelation. First of all, they overlook the present tense. And that is that after chapter 3, the church is gone. You never see the church in any of the events in Revelation. Because the church no longer is there. It's a chronological book, and the church is present tense. And the present tense at that point, after chapter 3, is future. Everything after that is future tense. That's when John has, is called up into heaven after the letter to the churches, the present tense are, are given, and you never see it again. I'll, I'll explain it from the text. Stay with me now while I'm explaining some things because I want us to understand some events. There's a major confusion today between the second coming of Jesus when He comes to judge the world and when Jesus comes and calls us up into the clouds. It's a big difference between when His feet touch the ground on Mount Olives and when He comes in the sky. Matter of fact, we see that event described in the text we read in opening this morning, don't we? Behold, He comes. Do you see it? Look down. Is it verse 7 in Revelation? Yeah, verse 7. Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Even so, Amen. In other words, when John is in the past tense portion of Revelation, he said, Behold, He cometh, and every eye is going to see Him. Now, I like Max Licato, as far as I know. Okay, and I like the... What's the Left Behind guy? Who wrote the Left Behind series? Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye. They're nice guys, and they write great books. Okay, I'm not bashing those guys at all. And I'm not bashing people that I have not carefully looked at this. But do you realize that Jesus Christ coming with the twinkling of an eye is not the manner of His appearance, it's the suddenness of His appearance? The idea, you know, and again, it, now it's on Facebook. I'm tired of this. You know, I wish I could go back, you know, into maybe the 16th century or whoever said this first and assassinate the person who came up with the bumper sticker that is, you know, regurgitated. You know, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Now it's on Facebook. In case of the rapture, this Facebook page will be unmanned. You know, and I'm just tired of that. I, 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 I'm being sarcastic. I'm, I'm uh, Mark Twaining on you guys if you don't know the quote that I'm, that I'm giving you. But the reality of it is, you know, Mark Twain would talk about a guy, you know, uh, in, in Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, told about a court jester that told him, regurgitated, recycled joke from whatever century. So I wish I could go back to that century and kill the guy that told it first so we wouldn't have to hear it through the centuries. <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> the, the same recycled joke over and over and over again. Okay, now, having said all that, let, let, me, let me seriously give you something for your consideration. The twinkling of an eye is the suddenness of Jesus coming, not the manner of Jesus coming. When Jesus comes, the whole world isn't going to go, what in the world happened to the Christians? Now the conspiracy is there's going to be an abduction. You know, everybody's going to, you know, they're having all these, um, you know, alien stuff because, uh, because they're trying to prepare for when Jesus takes the believers and they're going to try to have an explanation for what happened to them. No, this is what's going to happen. Every eye is going to behold Him. And the kindred says, hey, I'm not going to bewail Him, are you? Are you going to go, oh, boo, boo, boo. I'm going to say He's here. I'm coming. I'll be doing my Superman moves, doing the flips as I go up. You know, what? I'm going to be... I, it's time to party. I'm not trying to be irreverent or silly, but get this. I'm going up. And when the angel that appeared to the disciples when Jesus ascending, how did, how did Jesus go up when He ascended? Up through the clouds. Went through the clouds, and a cloud received him out of their sight, right? And then the angel said, He's this, this uh, same Jesus will so come in like manner as you have seen him ascend into heaven. So is it going to be, and everybody's gone, nobody knows what happened? No, Jesus is going to, in his glory, appear in the sky. And the saints are going up! And everybody's going to watch. And everyone will know what happened. 
And I'll be going, I told you so. I told you this was going to happen. You know? No, I'll be just like, he's, I'm going, yeah. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be real, folks. And anyone who tries to say, you know, I just don't believe there's a God. I don't believe that Jesus is really God. No, 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 no. This, this is going to be real. And everyone in the world is going to know where the believers went and they're going to know who took them and they're going to know who Jesus is. Just like that. And that will be, of course, the next event on Jesus' calendar. And it's indicated right here in Revelation chapter 1. Yes, ma'am? Will those people that witness it get saved? That will be their choice. They'll make a decision. If you're asking the question, and we will deal with this further on in Revelation, if you'll be asking the question of whether uh, people during those times when Jesus and God are judging the world for sin, because Jesus will not come as a lamb. He's going to come as a judge next time. If you're asking the question of whether or not they can be born again, yes. You know, the 144,000 that are the 12 tribes of Israel, those 144,000 will be there, and they will have become believers in that time frame. So, will, will the gospel have its saving power in that time? The answer, I believe, is absolutely. Absolutely so. So, is that specifically what you're asking? Yes. Okay. All right, now we'll get there and we'll deal with that question. I've heard a lot of preaching that, uh, contrary to that, but uh, there are no future believers unless people believe in the future uh, for after this event. So, good question. Glad you're thinking. Glad you're engaged. Now, uh, I want to... Wow. I want to get finished with the message today before we're out of time. All right, now I want to just point out chronologically today what I was emphasizing is that John is uh, a personal participant in the Revelation. I just want to look at the tense in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. John, I, John, who also am, what tense is that? Present. Present tense, and that's a reference to what age? The church age, the now age, right? I am your brother and companion in tribulation. Now, John is not merely writing this letter and recording it for people that are his contemporaries. This is the Word of God here. This is an eternal book, and this is written to the church, the revelation is. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Okay, so was John part of the tribulation? No, no. Yes! I'm your brother in tribulation. I'm your companion in tribulation. Wednesday night I gave you guys the softballs, the lollipops. This Today I'm going to give you the one where you answer wrong every time you yeah. know. Was John a companion in, tri in tribulation and in persecution? And the answer is that this is something that is a misnomer right now. This is an argument that individuals make that try to say that believers are going to be part of what we call the seven years tribulation. They like to take that phrase and make something out of it. It's a week. It's the last final week of Daniel, the one that's still unfulfilled after the Messiah is cut off. So we've got 69 weeks of Daniel fulfilled. There's one week left, and that's the week of tribulation. But the tribulation that we're talking about in those terms... Now, if you have questions specifically about this, you can ask afterward. Feel free. But the tribulation we're talking about, that final week of Daniel, is an event that is not fulfilled. Here's a question. Is there persecution today? Sure. Yes. Is there tribulation today? I have Facebook friends that tell me about what happens in their daily lives in India, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Muslim countries, and I'm telling you what they're going through. They're being murdered, they're being raped, they're being tortured, they're being killed. They are going through tribulation. What they're going through is terrible. Listen to me, but God isn't doing it. God is not doing it. Wicked ones, evil ones are doing it. God is not. If you read 1 Peter chapter 2 and Peter talks about if ye be buffeted for your faults, there's no glory in that. But if you're persecuted for Christ, the prophets were persecuted. Jesus is persecuted. There's a difference between being persecuted by the wicked for the cause of Christ and having God's grace in it and also God's sympathy. We will see as we read through the Revelation that there are literally the martyrs, the saints who have been killed and their blood has been shed and they're underneath the throne and they're crying, How long, O Lord, till Thou avenge us? And there's going to be a day when God avenges them. But there's a big difference between judgment of the wicked 
at the hand of a God who people, all the eyes can behold and the kindreds of the earth are going to bewail. There's a big difference between that God judging the wicked and the events that are for the wicked versus what righteous people go through. Can you suffer as a believer? Yes, but you'll have God's grace for it. These individuals are suffering without God's grace at the hand of God. And my friend, it's not confusing to understand the difference. If you want to play little games, say, oh, tribulation is used in this context, and in this, no, I'm talking about tribulation at the hand of God versus tribulation, like John is talking about, that he's a participant in along with other believers. You see the difference? It ought to be clear for us, it ought to be helpful for us, okay? Now, uh, in, uh, matter of fact, let me just read a couple verses uh, that, that, that correspond with this. I want to cover this because it is, it is vitally important. It, it's, it's timely today to, to cover this. 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 9 through 11. Uh, Paul said, I think that God has set forth us the apostles just last as they were appointed uh, to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. But unto, even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And I find some comfort here, by the way, if you struggle. Does it ever bother you that you have it so good and others have it so bad? It does me. Listen, people contact me on it, like literally, probably, if I didn't block them uh, from messaging me. I block a lot of people from messaging me because I just don't have time for it. But uh, if I talked to everybody who messaged me, I'd probably have 150 people a day appealing to me because of the hardship that they're going through in other parts of the world. And I'm just overwhelmed by it, to be frank with you. I can't do anything about it. And sometimes I just think, God, you know, I've said this a lot of times, God's not an American, uh, but He made me an American, and I'm thankful for it. I, I'll, be, I'll be frank with you. If you and I are to compare our plight and the things we've been through, perhaps, perhaps we've suffered similarly. In other words, I've suffered sickness, I've suffered loss, I've been through some hard things. But compare with people that are in peril for their life because they're believers, forget about it, man. I, I haven't had anything close. I've had people deride me or mock me because I'm a believer. Didn't hurt too much, to be honest with you. See, I haven't been through that. And sometimes I'm guilt-tripped guilt, guilt -tripped a little bit by it. Sometimes I feel like, well, why do I have it so good and they have it so bad? Well, God had them be born in that country. And God's using them in that country. And Paul here is contrasting literally the ease of life with which the believers at Corinth are living. They're rich. He's poor. They're, he's persecuted. They're living in the lap of luxury. And he says, this is, God's called me to be a spectacle in this instance. And you know something, my friend? God has that calling for some. And He's also got crowns and rewards for people that go through that. Yeah. And man, I'll tell you, don't we ought just to just have the pat answer of, well, that's, you know, God wants them to go through it and not me, so it's not my problem. No, no. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. I'm not saying dis be dismissive of what other people are going through in other parts of the world. Be thankful for what you have and be understanding that God's given you that. It's something that you're, you're privileged to have a good life and you ought to just be thankful for it and live for Jesus because of it. See, not, not in spite of it. Now, then Paul uh, talked about in verse... Um, this is in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. I alluded to this. Uh, Paul talks about going through persecution because of your own faults. He said, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, it's acceptable to God. But Paul simply here is saying, you're not being persecuted if you caused a problem and you have the effects of your problem. You know, you ever met the victim? I mean, they do terrible things to people, and then because people don't like them, they're the victim. <laughs> You ever see somebody, it's just like they're just obnoxious to everybody, and then when somebody doesn't like them, it's just like, man, nobody likes me. It's your own fault. You're obnoxious. You're mean. You, you treat people badly. You're not kind to anyone. You don't love anybody. You only love yourself. It's a small wonder nobody loves you. 
Right? And that's what Paul's saying. So if you're persecuted because you're a punk, <laughs> you're not persecuted. There's no glory in it. But if you're persecuted because you love Jesus and you live for Jesus, it's a different thing. Do you understand? I pardon my vernacular. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. But uh, that's just the, my form of communication today, and I don't mean to be uh, too crude or whatever. Paul, John here, though, speaks of the present tense and past tense. In verse 10, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard. You tell me what tense is was? Past. Past tense. Heard. What tense is it? Past. Past tense. So what is Paul speaking of? Things that had already happened at the point that the Holy Spirit had him pen these words. Okay? Uh, go back, go down to the end of chapter 1. Will you please go to verse 19 because this is the theme of Revelation. Again, good grammar, uh, good letter is always written with a purpose statement where before you say what you're going to say, uh, you say what you're going to say. Before you give the content of the information, you say, here's what I'm saying. And then you say it, and then you go back and you restate it. And so in verse 19, the Holy Spirit told John this, Write the things which thou hast heard, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Okay, hast seen. Past, present, or future. Past seen. Literally the things that happened from the moment that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day uh, and saw the Lord. So the things that he saw. And then the things which are past, present, or future. Present, current. Yeah, current, present. That's the church age. That's the time in which John is living. And then the things which shall be hereafter. Future tense. Future tense. Okay, do you guys understand this? In other words, Revelation, if you'll look at it, Revelation chapters 1 through 3 are the pres or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1 is past tense. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are present tense. And chapter 4 is a transition that takes us into the future tense, which is all the rest of the prophecy of the Revelation. We're not into anything that is future. Right now we're into the present. And having said that, let me just say that as we look at the seven churches that Jesus has a message for, that's present tense, folks. That's today. Now, I have seen it carefully laid out with the correspondence being shown, the different ages in church history, and uh, the corresponding of the ages between Ephesus and Smyrna and Thyatira and, uh, and, and so on all the way down to Laodicea seven church ages and I've seen revelation written with or I mean revelation studied from that perspective and I find that to be insightful somewhat helpful uh, but here are some fallacies with that interpretation of revelation if you'll permit me just for a moment so if you can tune back in before we finish up this morning here are some fallacies with interpreting revelation that way first of all you take uh, the majority of the present away when it comes to the application of the Scripture. In other words, if Ephesus was the first and second century of the church, or even the first hundred years of the church, well, that's already passed now. And so it really isn't much good for me because it's already finished out of Smyrna. And so you see what I'm saying? In other words, the Scripture is written... All, remember the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. And the prophet here in the present tense is that it's for the church age. And so I believe that every single one of these churches has the ability to be characterized like these seven churches in Asia. In other words, man, I'll tell you what, I want the good things in that. I want the good things in every age, and I want to be aware of the bad things in every age as well. You see that? In other words, wouldn't you agree with me that if you were to visit different churches and you were to characterize them on the basis of how the Lord characterized the seven churches, that you could see some of the good things today from any of the church, of those churches? They're not just an age. And couldn't you see as well some of the bad things? Okay, so let's look at the good and the bad, and we'll finish up. Let's go to uh, the present tense in chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 2. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Here's what he said. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them 
which are evil. Now, as you study through Revelation, can I encourage you to go to Acts and do some additional study? Study the origin of the church in Acts. Study when Paul and the evangelist, the missionary team in Acts chapter 18 went to Ephesus and where that church was planted and established. And then go to Acts chapter 20. Uh, and really, uh, Acts, Acts uh, chapter 20 and verses, I think it's like 11 through... Uh, let me just read a couple of verses to you. And you say, Pastor, I know you're supposed to be done. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, folks. Really, we're moving, we're, we're going through volumes of material very, very quickly here, and I don't have much more for you today. Acts chapter 20, uh, if you want to turn there, that's fine. If, if you prefer just have me read it, that's fine as well. If we look down to verse 16, this is when Paul's on his way to be bound in Jerusalem and, and to become a prisoner. Uh, oh, I'm in 17, that's why it doesn't read there. Um, this is when Paul is heading to Jerusalem. He doesn't want to spend time in Asia, according to verse 16. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So he's trying to get to Jerusalem before the day of Pentecost. And so in verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. This is the church in Asia, the church at Ephesus. Now again, this is the second fallacy in the seven church ages. The second fallacy is if they are just merely church ages, they would not be actual cities with actual churches in them. These are actual churches that are being written to. The word angel, to the angel of the church. Uh, the word angel means messenger or one who represents God. And it would seem really, really apparent that that would have an either apostle or pastoral reference. The person who is the, the leader or the messenger to the church. Literally, these seven churches are going to get a copy of this letter. So it's written to them. And so literally, somebody's going to deliver that copy. That's going to be a messenger or an angel. Angelos means messenger. That's what the word angel means. So if you're confused and you wonder if you know every church has a protective angel, no, we as individuals have protective angels. That's a different Bible study. That's a different event. But I, I'm not necessarily sure, hey, this church could have a protective angel. What he did until Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church got started, I'm not sure. Probably was held in reserve for thousands of years. But... Uh, Okay, that's, um, I should stop being silly, mixing things in. But the reality of it is, is that uh, we have individual angels, but this is not an angelic being in the sense of uh, a non-human individual, and someone who's not made in the image of God as a messenger for God. These are literal messages, messengers to the church. The word angel, you understand that? What it means? And again, that could be an individual study. But angel here is not heavenly being. It's the person who's going to deliver the message to the church. Ephesus is a little literal church. And now here's a message Paul had. He sent for the elders. And when they were come to him, he said to them, You know that from the first day that I came to a into Asia, verse 18, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Now, I know I'm reading this fast with no commentary. I'm sorry. Uh, now, let's go down to verse 28. Paul says to the pastors of the church at Ephesus, or the elders, the word elder is used interchangeably with pastor, with bishop, and uh, in the New Testament, that's a different study. I can show you that very easily. Titus is a good place to study that at. Verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch. And remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. Okay, now, stop there. I know I read a lot, but Paul literally calls the, the leadership of the church at Ephesus to him, and he warns them, watch out for grievous, for false teachers who are ravenous wolves, and really watch out because some of you, some of you are going to be those people. Now let's look at the description years later. A lot of years later, 
uh, when John is conveying the message specifically from the Lord to the church at Ephesus. These things, verse 1 of chapter 2 in Revelation, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And notice this next phrase. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. They listened. Isn't that great? In other words, Paul said, watch out for false teachers, for false apostles. And Jesus said, I know what you've done about people that are false teachers and they claim to have Bible authority and they don't. And you've tried them, you've looked at what they've said, you've waited, and you've found them liars. Good job. It's a commendation to the church at Ephesus. And I love it, don't you? I love to hear that things went well. Don't you hate it when you just, oh, I can see things going bad, and you go and you warn somebody, hey, that's, that's going to work out really badly. And then you see a 180. People are like, whoa, yeah, you're right. We can't go that direction. We better straighten things out. And Paul had this last conversation with the elders at Ephesus and said, you guys watch out for false teachers. They're going to come in and they're going to wreck the church. And some of you are probably going to be the false teachers. And they dealt with it. They, they, they examined those things. They examined the people. And they said, uh-uh, not here. And they clean house. And in verse uh, 2, Thou hast tried them which say they're apostles. Verse 3, And hast borne and hast patience. And for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Aren't you glad that the church at Ephesus is still carrying on after all these years? You know, it's really, really tragic, isn't it? <laughs> when you get a phone call from somebody that says, you know, thus and so church, man, if you went there, you wouldn't recognize it. Mm. Used to be a great place. Used to be a great ministry. But it's not the same anymore. It's changed. Mm. Or it's gone. It's closed its doors. And people change. Churches change. But Ephesus didn't. I mean, it's still a solid work. It's a solid church. And in verse... For nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. I want to stop here. This is where we're finishing up today, as far as we're getting. <clears throat> the ultimate warning to Ephesus is that if you don't get back to your first love, I'm going to come and remove your candlestick. And the idea is you're going to lose your, you're going to lose your your church. It's going to be taken away. You're a light. You're a candle, in Ephesus. But if you don't get back to your first love, I'm going to come and I'm going to take away your candlestick. There's a lot of application here about our first love, isn't there? A lot of application. But you know, I think that that is that's a warning that would could be hindered by all Bible-believing churches today. Could be hindered, heeded by all Bible-believing churches today, couldn't it? Left your first love. Man, there was a day when... You love Jesus and you want to live for Jesus, and it's the only thing that mattered. Oh, you're solid about this and this and this and this. And man, great. I'll tell you what, if I want to go to a church where there's not going to be false teaching, Ephesus is the place. It's a good church, isn't it? And there are people that are faithful there. I mean, uh, probably the same people that Paul called in the assembly, a lot of them are just still plugging along, still serving God. What encouragement that is. But Jesus said. You're doing all the right things, but you don't love me the same. You don't love me like you used to. And you know, he doesn't say, you know, it's over for you. He says, get back to that. Get back to that. Go back to where you're supposed to be. You know, love is a choice, isn't it? Love always is a choice. And the priority of love is always a choice as well. And here we see, you know, it's not that they don't love Jesus, it's just that He's not their first love. It's not, oh, you don't... No, they're faithful to Him and they've stuck with it. They haven't left. They haven't quit. They haven't gone back. He's just not their first love anymore. And we could go on and on about that, but you know, I think we could self-examine to ask the question, is Jesus my first love, couldn't we? We could say, who's the first person I think about in the morning? Who's the first person I talk to? Who's the first person I consider when I make a decision? Who's the first person? And you just ask that question and you'll know who your first love is. And probably, 
probably at least at the time it was Jesus. And hopefully, it still is. And yet, if it isn't, the warning is, it's not too late. The candlestick's not removed. Go back to your first love. Remember from where you're falling. Repent. Father, I pray that you would take what we've learned today in the present tense and help this church to ask the question, are we just faithful? Are we hardworking? Do we love Jesus? Do we love Jesus? Is Jesus our first love? And Lord, as, as we look at ourselves, I think all of us would have to say, not like we should. And so I pray that you would make this a time in our service that we could repent. Before we finish our prayer, I want to just have a practical time where we make a decision on the basis of what we've heard today. It might be that you're here today and it doesn't take a lot of convincing or words by myself, but the Holy Spirit of God just put His finger right on something in your life and He said, no, you don't love me like you used to. If that's you and you're here today and you say, Pastor, uh, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around, I want everybody to have a private, personal time. But if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, God put His finger on something and said, you know something, I mean, just the instant I heard that, I thought, I don't love Jesus. Don't love Him like I should or don't love Him like I used to. And the Holy Spirit of God convicted me about that today. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to do something. I want to get back to that first love. If that's you, just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, uh, don't, don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. But I don't love Jesus like I used to. I don't love Jesus like I should. Yeah, just slip right up, right back down. That's it. Right up, right back down. Okay? Let's take a minute and let's, let's take the time to do something about that then. Our invitation is very simple. It's a time when we invite you as the Holy Spirit is led for you to do business with God. I'm going to ask our piano to play, but we're not going to stand and sing today. I'd like us just to remain in our seats this morning while the pianist begins playing. And I want to give us a space, a little bit of time, to do two things. First of all, to deal, do business with God. And second of all, to do one of the things we've come to today for. And that's just to bow before Him and to give Him that first place in our lives. A little bit of time of worship as we conclude our service this morning. All right, I'm going to ask Angela if you could please uh, begin to play while we do business with the Lord.